Hi everybody, welcome to class 5. Uh, in this first video we're going to get into learning the basics of faults and earthquakes. And this is kind of a continuation of what we've been learning about tectonic plates and plate boundaries and volcanoes. So why do we care about earthquakes? Well one thing is that they are the manifestation of tectonic plate motion. Literally earthquakes are what happen as tectonic plates grind past each other. So we can learn a lot about the big picture of tectonics by studying earthquakes. Of course, on a more relevant level, earthquakes kill many thousands of people each year. This is a problem that absolutely is not going away. It's just going to keep getting worse as population densities grow. So it's still really important to understand earthquakes, and uh, many millions of dollars each year go into studying them and trying to mitigate their effects. So to motivate this a little bit, uh, I'll introduce you to a few of the most deadly earthquakes in recent world history. We've got the Kashmir earthquake uh, in 2005, 80,000 dead. Haiti 2010, 223,000 dead. Not even a very large earthquake. Uh, Tangshan, China, 76, 500,000 people dead. And we won't have time to get into it in this class, unfortunately, but it's really this kind of complicated interface between engineering, urban design, and geology that really determines how deadly these quakes are. And then some random factors, even like time of day, you know, whether people are home in their apartments or not. Now, in contrast, here's some of the deadliest quakes in U.S. history. Of course, the famous San Francisco 1906, roughly 3,000 people dead. And then a couple of others in California, 1933, 1989, which killed between a 60 and 115 people. So one of the things that should strike you right away is how few deaths have occurred in these earthquakes in the United States. Part of the reason is, of course, because they occurred longer ago, maybe population densities were a little bit lower. But another big reason is because engineering and building standards in the United States are so much higher than much of the uh, rest of the world that our buildings tend to withstand large earthquakes fairly well, and the death toll tends to be pretty limited. So in this lecture, uh, we'll learn a couple things. Um, we'll learn the basics of plate boundaries and fault types. Then we'll learn about the earthquake cycle and then we'll finish with a quick slide about earthquake magnitude. So stepping back to the big picture, recall that Earth is partitioned into tectonic plates. So we think of these as rigid blocks floating around on the mantle. They're between 7 and 70 kilometers thick. And they're moving uh, generally following patterns of mantle convection. They are really the skin on this soup that's being carried along by the the flow of that hot mantle underneath. But of course, this motion is not perfectly smooth. These are like huge cars smashing into each other and grinding past each other. And we can, it's along the plate boundaries where we get a lot of this uh, collision and grinding between the plates. There's three types of plate boundaries. Uh, convergent, where two plates come together. So an example of that would be a subduction zone. Divergent, where two plates move apart. An example of that would be a mid-ocean ridge, like the mid-Atlantic ridge. And then we've got strike-slip, which is a, a type we haven't talked about yet. That's where two plates move laterally past each other. So they're not going away, they're not going towards, they're just moving side by side past each other. And we'll look at an example of a San Andreas Fault which is one of the better studied strike-slip boundaries in the world. Another kind of overview piece is how fast is this happening? Plates are typically moving relative to each other roughly 2 to 12 centimeters per year. So that doesn't seem very fast, but if you're up around 12 centimeters per year, that plate is moving a meter every 10 years. So that's a noticeable difference, uh, certainly in a human time scale. Of course, many other plates are moving much more slowly. So corresponding to those different types of plate boundaries are a bunch of different types of faults 
that actually accommodate the motion between the plates. So faults are fractures in the crust where literally the two blocks of crust on either side of the fracture are able to slide past one another and accommodate that relative motion between plates. And like different types of plate boundaries, there's three different types of faults. The first type is called a strike-slip fault. That has a vertical fault plane, and the two blocks of crust move laterally past one another. Then we have a thrust fault, which has a relatively low angle dipping fault plane, kind of like a ramp, and one block is moving upwards over another block. So that's called a thrust fault, and those tend to be found on convergent boundaries, where two plates are moving towards each other or colliding. And then the third type is an extensional fault. So in this case, we've got a pretty steeply dipping ramp fracture and one block is literally falling away from the other block or sliding off of the other block. And that's called an extensional fault. And we tend to find that in divergent uh, tectonic settings because as this one block falls off the other one, the crust is literally stretching apart. So those are the three fault types. Now here's an example of a strike-slip fault. Um, this is the San Andreas Fault. It runs the length of California from Los Angeles area all the way up to the Northern California. And it is the plate boundary between the North American plate and the Pacific plate, which relative to one another, the Pacific plate is moving northwest, the North American plate is moving southeast. And if you've ever been to California or if you go, you'll see lots of evidence of this fault. Here is an example from Southern California where we can see the fault as this big crack in the earth that's literally se separating totally different topography on either side as the two blocks move past each other. And the San Andreas Fault is moving about six centimeters per year. So that's pretty fast. Or I should say the two plates are moving six centimeters per year relative to each other. So that's the intro to faults. Let's look now at the earthquake cycle. So the earthquake cycle is the idea that faults spend most of their time locked. Most of the time, there's actually no slip occurring on a fault plane. Instead, it's locked. And what happens is strain is building up. So energy and force, is energy is being stored in the rock as the far field plates continue to move, but the fault itself doesn't move. And that's called the interseismic period. The co-seismic period lasts for only a split second, as suddenly the stresses on the fault become too much. The friction that's holding the fault together is overcome, and the fault moves in an earthquake event. And that's a co-seismic earthquake event. It might last only a few seconds as these plates suddenly move. Now. They're basically, the area right along the fault has actually caught up with the rest of the crust further away from the fault. And this releases a huge amount of stored seismic energy. And where does that energy come from? The energy comes from a process called elastic strain accumulation. Basically, we can think of rocks as acting like a spring. And as in the interseismic period, as the plates continue to move past each other, the rocks near the fault get compressed and loaded just like a spring that's being squished. Stress builds and builds, and then eventually the stress becomes too much and the fault ruptures. So let's take a quick simplified video of this. Uh, here's the fault itself. It's a strike-slip fault. So we're looking down on it like in map view, okay? And of course, this plate is going up your screen, this plate's coming down your screen. We're gonna watch these bars move and we're gonna watch this, the stress build up along the fault. Okay, the far field plates are moving, but notice the fault is still locked, the stress is building. Boom, there's the earthquake. And as that spring releases, 
sends the seismic wave energy out through the crust. Okay, so right after the earthquake, all of that compressed strain is released, and the stress on the fault temporarily drops to zero. But of course, the plates are still moving. And now, presumably, the fault is locked again. And so the stresses start to build up again because those plates are still moving at this very steady rate. Okay? So we think about this as stress over time. So time is on the x-axis here. Right after an earthquake, we see the stress start to build up again. And then an earthquake happens, the stress drops. But the plates continue to move, so that stress builds up again. And then another earthquake happens, and the stress drops. And so on, repeating these earthquakes. Now, if there's a consistent amount of stress, or a stress threshold that's required to trigger an earthquake, and if the plates are moving at the same speed over time, and the fault isn't changing, it may be the case that the amount of stress required to trigger an earthquake is roughly the same each time, and that it actually is that stress level is reached after a given amount of time. Now, if that's the case, then we expect earthquakes to have a recurrence interval that's constant. So the recurrence interval is the time between earthquake events. It's this time right here. And if that stress builds at a constant rate, and there's a constant stress threshold, the earthquakes will re recur after a fixed time interval. Of course, this is exciting for scientists because it means we might be able to predict earthquakes. And there have been some examples where we've successfully predicted earthquakes quite well. One example is uh, what's called the Parkfield segment of the San Andreas Fault. So here is uh, San Francisco up here. Los Angeles is down here. Here's the San Andreas Fault coming up this way. This red section is called the Parkfield section. And what we know about it is that there's been a magnitude 6 earthquake almost exactly every 22 years for the last roughly 150 years. So literally, the stress builds up for 22 years, we get a small earthquake, and then the stress starts building again. So this is a classic example of characteristic earthquake behavior, where we get these really consistent quakes. In contrast, this section in green just north of it is called the creeping section. That's a section where there's no earthquakes. The fault actually just moves continuously over time. Um, and the friction on the fault is so low that, in fact, no even the slightest bit of stress causes the fault to yield, and no s elastic strain is built up, and there's no earthquakes. The fault just continues to slide past. You can think of it basically as a smooth section of the fault versus maybe a rough section of the fault. OK, so now you know something about the earthquake cycle. Let's look at earthquake magnitude. And this is a little bit technical. You don't need to know this, um, for example, for the exam, but you will need to know it in lab. So I want to introduce it. So the amount of energy released in an earthquake can be described in two different ways. Um, one way to describe it is as the seismic moment, okay? And the seismic moment, or M0, is determined by uh, multiplying the area of the slip plane of the fault times the average slip distance times the shear modulus. Now let's just look at that. So area is this whole area of the fault plane that slipped. It's a two-dimensional idea. The slip distance, d, is like a directionality. So it's like the linear distance the fault slipped. And then this shear modulus, mu, is basically the roughness coefficient. It's a measure of how rough the fault surface is. Now. It's more convenient for people to think of earthquakes in terms of moment magnitude, this second kind of set of units. And this is basically just a log transformation. 
we take the seismic moment, we stick it into this base 10 log transformation, and we get out a moment magnitude. So you may need to use these equations in lab, but I'll provide them for you. And the final thing I want to hit home is this idea of the characteristic earthquake, right? If we want to have an earthquake that occurs over roughly the, at a constant recurrence interval and is roughly the same size each time, then the earthquake event itself has to actually be consistent. What does that mean? It means the area that slips and the slip distance both have to be consistent between successive earthquakes. So it's not just about recurring over a fixed time interval. It's about each earthquake having the same properties, the same area of slip and the same distance of slip. Great, so I'll leave you with these three concept questions. Um, there's no quiz associated with this video. And I'll see you shortly in the second video from this class where we'll look at how we use paleoseismology to study past earthquakes.